Uh, dear friends, um, thank you for making time for this program, for this presentation. Uh, today's film may be somewhat unusual for you. Uh, it's not uh, a remarkable, a renowned film in terms of its cinematography, so do not search for it in the Criterion Collection catalog. It is not there. Uh, in fact, the value of this film um, is probably, or at least in my opinion, is in when it appeared and in what circumstances, which was very significant, as well as in its content. So what I'm going to do now, before Philip takes over and before we uh, watch the film proper, uh, I will try to give a background of these two aspects, the when of the film and the what of the film. Uh, so as you can see uh, from this poster, uh, the film was released in 1988. Um, it was the time of Gorbachev uh, being in power. Uh, he came to power in 1985, and very soon started the policy of glasnost, or opening up, which uh, implied being open to the others and to ourselves, to our own society, about uh, the things that are not really so flattering uh, in our history, in our society, and uh, openly admitting certain wrongs and uh, owning up uh, what was not owned up earlier. It was a tremendous uh, step um, and it picked up rather fast um, and it was during his rather short tenure that quite a number of films uh, of totally different quality came up. So he came to power in 85, initiated this policy. In 1986, uh, the fifth conference uh, of the Soviet cinematographers took place in Moscow. And it was directly inspired by this new policy. Um, and what was supposed to be yet another routine conference, like many other Soviet conferences, the gathering of uh, directors, film directors, and actors, and stars, and scriptwriters uh, created a revolution. Uh, so it was decided at this conference to push the boundaries of censorship uh, to uh, directly address the things that could not be addressed uh, under the previous uh, governments. And uh, so this film, which follows it, um, it's like 88, I can say that uh, nothing of this kind was even imaginable three or even two years earlier. So, uh, so this is about the context, uh, why it was significant. And again, it was not... Um, uh, the only film uh, which was quite novel in its content and shockingly novel for, for the larger public. Um, there were other films, but we are going to talk about this one today. Uh, now about the content, uh, the what of the film. Uh, the film rotates uh, around uh, two historical dates, which were both historical as well as historic. So it is set in 1953, and there are two dates there that are referred to, and several events that we are going to talk about. So uh, on the 5th of March in 1953, uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, the powerful leader, breathed his last. Apparently, it was a very painful death. He was clinging to life for about five days. He was in agony, and the people who saw it were 
really terrified by the spectacle of it. Uh, and his 30 year long rule came to an end. Uh, and just like in many authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, the death of such a leader who was considered a father uh, made the whole country inconsolable. Uh, what was actually underst understandable and normal was not even imaginable. People could not imagine that the father of the nation would leave us. Uh, and to mark this event, uh, the decapitated government, uh, in its infinite wisdom, uh, decided to release the common law detainees, to grant them amnesty. So, um, it was initiated almost immediately, and um, in a short period of time, within several months, uh, 1.3 million people were released. Initially, uh, it was supposed to be first-time offenders, uh, aged people, pregnant women, women who, who were convicted for something but were pregnant in jail and, and, and whatnot, so they were supposed to be released, but for various reason, reasons it was decided to release many more people, and not just first-time offenders, but uh, a lot of other people got released to the tune of 1.2 or maybe even 1.3 million people out of the population of maybe 160 million. So you can imagine the incarceration rate. And uh, you can also imagine uh, what it resulted in, in the streets of the country. So it immediately created a security and safety imbalance and there was a significant spike in uh, organized crime, in violent crime, particularly murders and rapes all across the country, these two things. And uh, in fact the government started really physically eliminating people in encounters, people meaning criminals, uh, and, and taking some of them back uh, for now new offenses. Uh, but the damage was done, and in fact, at that time, there were two spikes in organized crime and violent crime in Soviet Union. It was 1945-46, immediately uh, in the aftermath of World War II, when the country was awash with guns and uniforms, and when criminals had easy access to guns, everybody in fact has access to guns, and uh, criminals impersonated as policemen, they impersonated as uh, army men, and it was hell maybe for a couple of years. And then the second hell came all over the place uh, in 1953, in spring and summer, when because of this amnesty, uh, enormous number of people uh, were released without much consideration. Now, uh, another uh, important historic event, uh, which is referred to and is directly linked to the events in this film, um, is the coup and removal of the all-powerful uh, chief head of NKVD, uh, the predecessor of KGB, uh, and the right hand of Stalin, his uh, compatriot from Georgia, uh, Lavrenti Beria, uh, who, after the demise of Stalin, uh, was deemed to be uh, the de facto uh, leader who could easily have gotten into the shoes, or rather the military boots of Stalin, and uh, he was really powerful, he assumed even more responsibilities, 
he was particularly bloody uh, and the longest serving head of NKVD under Stalin. Uh, there were like five of them under Stalin and he lasted the longest, uh, around 15 years, um, which was remarkable in its own, um, in its own context. Uh, because the people in that position did not last that long and uh, most of them ended badly. Uh, but uh, probably there was some kind of understanding between Stalin and Beria, so and Beria was probably foxier compared to his predecessors. But anyway, this apart, uh, he was a particularly bloody person. He supervised the explosive growth of the Gulag system the labor camp system, uh, which had already been established all across the country, especially in the extreme north, in Siberia, in Central Asia. Uh, and under his supervision, in, uh, in the years immediately following World War II, uh, the population of the Gulag grew from one million to two million people. Now again, maybe one, one or two million people would mean nothing in the context of India with its gigantic population, but let us put it in the proper context. So we are talking about around 160 million people of the whole country, and out of them, one million to two million are in camps, plus a uh, very high mortality rate. So it means people keep dying in camps, and new people, keep getting supplied, so at any given moment we are talking about two million people. So actually it's, it's, a, it's an impressive figure. And uh, he was the person who supervised uh, and, and initiated this expansion, and roughly half of this population were political detainees uh, for various reasons. Like political detainees does not, did not at that time really mean that they really did something against the government or against the regime and uh, it's just that they were charged with something like that but it was an impressive number around one million people uh, convicted uh, for political reasons for treason sometimes absurd charges like you know spying for foreign intelligence agencies uh, all sorts of uh, absurd accusations and uh, so uh, Beria uh, was removed as a result of a coup uh, on 26th of June 1953 and uh, what we are going to see in this film directly relates to it and in fact it is discussed by the several characters who are completely incredulous how can this all-powerful man be out of power how can be how can he be uh, suddenly uh, the enemy of the people I mean we grew up with his portraits we have been walking with his portraits and, and posters and whatnot and suddenly he is the enemy while others on the contrary understand yeah we've been talking about it we've known it all along but uh, well so uh, so probably we are talking about the very end of June uh, 1953, the date exactly is not specified, and uh, <coughs> so uh, Beria was removed, he was so powerful that he was arrested by a group of generals, not just by some guards and minor officers, by, by the generals and even by one marshal, and uh, when he was condemned and executed, which he deserved, uh, the execution was also, uh, uh, the shooting was also executed by uh, another general because common guards, common people were not trusted with such a, with such a big task. So uh, that happened half a year later and we are not going to, to uh, this, this film does not refer to it. So, um, so these are the Ba this is the backdrop, the historical backdrop of what is going to happen. So, uh, talking about the film, film itself, 
here we have two main characters uh, who are political exiles. And uh, w what was this political exile? So very often, uh, the people who survived, the political prisoners who survived the camps, uh, who, which was not very common, by the way, a lot of people perished in the camps, uh, they were uh, ordered to reside in a certain remote area uh, without any civil rights. They were not supposed to correspond with anybody. They, were, they had no right of meeting, seeing their family or corresponding with their family. And they were supposed to work and report to the local authorities, something we are going to see, uh, just to, you know, so that the authorities could put a tick in their register that yes, so and so is present, he is not uh, roaming around, and we are keeping an eye on him. And this way, tens of thousands of people were actually living somewhere and their families didn't even know where their loved ones were, whether they were alive or dead. And sometimes this exile continued for 10 years, uh, which is a very long duration. So we have two characters like that uh, who are political exiles somewhere in the unspecified location in the Russian north, not in Siberia, but in the northern part uh, of the European uh, part of Russia. And uh, they have to work in a very small village which has a trading station and uh, their relations or rather the attitudes of the local people, of the local authorities uh, to them uh, is very clearly negative. Uh, we are shown that their life is not really beer and skittles. It is a hard life. Nobody respects them. Uh, they're treated as doormats. And in fact, it is not uh, before half into the film that we actually learn their names. Before it, they're introduced by their uh, uh, nicknames uh, to show that they're completely dehumanized. And uh, so in this context, uh, we have the situation that this uh, village is uh, taken over by the recently amnestied prisoners of war uh, sorry, uh, the common, common law detainees who established the Jungle Raj uh, with their twisted uh, ideas of honor, with their grotesque uh, brutality, and uh, all of it uh, is, is shown or at least felt or hopefully will be felt even in this audience. And uh, this is the setting of what happens next. Um, the film was shot in Karelia, in the area of Russia, rather picturesque, uh, adjacent to uh, Finland. It, is, it was shot over a very short period of time, basically just one season, with very limited uh, number of actors, a relatively low budget film. Um, and it falls into two main parts. So it's 1953, the cold summer uh, for most of the part. And it's a very short but extremely significant sequence, 1955 in Moscow. Uh, from the point of view of this film, a very significant sequence. Um, so I will not take more of your time, uh, whatever things may come up, whatever questions you may have, uh, maybe we can discuss it after the screening. And um, for those of you who uh, stay long enough for the, for the discussion after the screening, there may be a bonus from my part. I would like to, if you're interested, I would like to draw your attention to uh, the very end 
uh, the, the concluding sequence, which has some very interesting culture-related details and cinematographic details that are very significant. So uh, I'd rather close now. So please, Philip. When I watched it, I had this impression. Uh, th there's not a lot of documentation about, about this, about the movie that I could find. So uh, what struck me a little bit is uh, uh, the, some similarity uh, with other movies and a very well-known genre, actually, that's the Western. And so I did a bit of uh, research. And uh, Western was actually a very popular genre also in Soviet Union. Uh, so I just uh, introduce you a little bit about uh, about this and and why. Like, um, like Western is is a very broad uh, broad genre. Like, uh, and uh, the similarity. I was thinking you you probably you you'll see when you see the movie with a, a very well known classic by Akira Kurosawa, uh, the Seven Samurai. And The Seven Samurai is not, strictly speaking, a Western, of course, but it's very much inspired by it. So, um, Western was very popular So you can in, in Soviet Union, and uh, you, you can classify it in two, two genres, two, two main categories. One is called, uh, usually we, we call them uh, the Soviet Westerns, really, and the other one was the Easterns or the uh, uh, Austerns. Um, before I, before I start, like just uh, also, uh, as Alexander mentioned, like this takes place in a pretty remote area. So that's a very common thing in building scenario when you call a story and when you put character in place, uh, uh, which is to put it in the pretty close, actually, even if the space is very wide, and, and of course Russia is so huge, like the, 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 the landscapes of the Westerns, but actually where the action takes place is pretty close. So, and people are, it's not easy to get out or people to step in. So it allows, as a narrative tool, basically, to highlight the relations and the tension between the different characters. You, you, you'll notice that. Okay, back to the Western. I, I have prepared like five minutes. There are a few clips here and there. So uh, there's a first clip. Like it's a movie, so 1977. Uh, do you know it? Uh, like I just said the title. Okay. <laughs> I found the, the, uh, the poster quite funny. and. Uh, <laughs> Surprising. So the plot, or what are the really uh, Soviet Westerns? They take place in America, actually. And everything is written in, in English. It just shows uh, cowboys and Indians, just like the American Westerns, uh, but with uh, some twists. And this one is a bit funny. Okay, yeah. Ах, жара, какая здесь жара! Все игра, вся наша жизнь игра. Новый гребь бывает удача и счастливые номера. Нет золотой долины, все проигрыш и прах. А выигрыш мужчины в отдельных номерах Играйте на не для наживы, а на весь кураж И номер счастливый будет ваш Он уехал, госпожу стережет Баретта
Извини. К сожалению, я не смог тебя предупредить о своем визите. Список, товарищ Сухов. Залина. Джамиля. Дюсель. Саида. Хафиза. Зухра. Лейла. Зульфия. Дюльчатай. Дюльчатай. Напра. За мной, барышни. Душа моя рвется к вам, ненаглядно Катерина Матвеевна, как журавль в небо. Однако случилась у нас небольшая заминка. Полагаю, суток на и не более. А именно, мне как сознательному бойцу поручили сопроводить группу товарищей с Братского Востока. Отметить надобно. Народ подобрался покладистый, можно сказать, душевный, с огоньком. 
Так что ноги мои бегут теперь по горячим пескам в обратную сторону, потому как долг революционный к тому нас обязывает. It's from 69, and in 69, like uh, we, we talked a bit in some previous class, here in the in US there was something called the New Hollywood in that period which started, and which also rewrites completely the, the format of the Western. Uh, we've seen, um, what did you show here? Uh, um, Jeremy Johnson. Jeremy Johnson, yeah. Uh, the, the, this movie actually was, uh, I read that it was proposed first to uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, who refused, and then uh, Andrei Konchalovsky, uh, who started actually to make this movie, and uh, he withdrew because he found uh, uh, it was not interesting enough. And actually he was given by the, I forgot the name of, of the director here, uh, and uh, actually he remade it so, so much, And that afterwards, Konchalovsky, uh, who is like, who, uh, has a big name actually, uh, he found it, uh, he turned as a, quite a masterpiece um, on several grounds. So the, the, the image is quite nice. You can see also that there's a, those images like of another woman who is out there. So there's a, a bit of some explanation. construction and uh, the way it is, it is made, I think it, it borrows a lot from uh, uh, that movie. That movie was the last one by a very popular actor, I think, Alexander Popanov. 
uh, who died a few, few months later, in uh, 87, uh, one of the main characters. And uh, so he's the director. So he's still active, you can see. And uh, mostly, like the stars, is the production for TV. So you can see the, the uh, that's the one that we're, we're showing today in uh, okay, 87, 98. And uh, yeah, thank you. Sir. I just would like to take uh, maybe a couple of more minutes of your time before we come over to the film proper. So uh, there will be definitely this adventure element in the film we are going to see, um, but it is completely subordinated by its uh, ethical dimension. And the main theme of what we are going to see, and this is what I would like you to also concentrate on, and I, I really hope that it comes across and you're able to feel it, it's uh, the moral dimension of it. It's a film about human suffering, it's a film about uh, loss and the pain of loss, it's, uh, it's a film about people who are actually loyal citizens, but they're completely squashed and, and destroyed by their own system, not by some invaders, not by some fascists, but by their own um, system which makes it even more painful. Uh, there is this legal, in, in the legal jargon there is this expression, breach of trust. Sorry for this uh, example, but suppose if a rape happens, uh, it is one thing, but if the rapist is one's father, it is not just uh, the physical uh, damage which is done, it is uh, the breach of trust because the father is supposed to be your first and main protector in life and if a woman loses this protector, a lot is lost along with it. So um, I would say the people, including the two main characters here, uh, and, and the millions of people like them actually experienced this breach of trust where the system that they worked for and, and both characters here are not some kind of dissidents and they're not some kind of anti-national elements but they're labeled enemies of the people because of absolutely absurd charges um, they experienced this breach of trust and there was absolutely no platform for them to express what they felt. And, and uh, the main uh, emotional theme would be the theme of injustice done to the people by their own state, by their own system. And complete absence of this, of, of any system of redressal, any system of compensation or whatever. And uh, this is uh, what I would like you to concentrate upon, um, apart from the adventure element which is also there. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for bringing it to my perspective.